morning. So here we are. Um, we uh, unfortunately um, we are unable to be meeting live uh, right now, but um, that is not going to stop us. We are just going to keep doing what we can do, and we are just going to be here. Um, so glad you are tuning in with us, and I uh, um, hope you've got your cup of coffee and you know you're um, you're somewhat comfortable there. Um, but uh, at least you are here with us, and we are here with you in your living room. So um, we're definitely glad. Just to give you a, a reminder so that you are aware, uh, we have decided to hold off until um, the uh, first of the year to uh, have our face-to-face -face or in-person meetings, um, just uh, uh, erring on the side of caution with just everything that's going on and uh, all of that. So um, just uh, keep that posted. We are still here, though, in the office during the week. Um, so if you do need anything, you will be able to reach us as far as that goes. Um, also, speaking of that, uh, we have, did we say seven of these seven. left? We have seven of the devotions left um, that uh, we had mentioned that uh, um, if you were needing a Christmas gift or something like that, these are great. Um, but there's seven of these left. Uh, they're $15. You can run by the office and uh, we'll have those up there and uh, we'll get these to you. If you don't want to come in uh, or get out of your car, just uh, you know, give us a text or uh, a phone call and we'll run it out to you and, uh, and everything. But uh, we have, like I said, seven of these left. And so first come, first serve. So if you're interested in one of these, um, uh, let us know and we will get them for you. Um, I want to uh, read this verse to you. Um, I was doing some reading, and this is the one that I came across uh, in my reading, and just thought, uh, uh, what a what a cool verse uh, out of Isaiah. So, I want to read this to you this morning, and then after we do that, we're going to pray, and we will jump right into uh, our worship and our message. Uh, but Isaiah chapter twelve, verse two, it says, "Behold, God is my salvation; I will trust, and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength." And my song, and he has become my salvation. Um, right now, again, we continue to say this. It seems to be the, the words that continually come out of our mouth right now, but with all the stuff that's going on and, and in the midst of all the situations and circumstances that are happening right now, um, we need to lean on him. Uh, not that we normally don't need to, but uh, right now, uh, more than ever, we need to lean on him. We need to look to him to be our strength. Um, and uh, there's nothing to fear because, again, in accordance to what the Scripture tells us, what can man do to me? Uh, we serve a big and mighty God. So uh, let's pray, and then let's just jump into the worship and uh, our message today. Father, we come to you, and we are so grateful, and we are so thankful uh, for your love for us. We are so thankful um, for just the ability that we have to look to you as our strength, as uh, our protector, as our guard, um, as the one who is our salvation, um, the one who has rescued us. And uh, Father, all of that uh, has happened through the sending of your son, Jesus. Um, the whole reason that we celebrate uh, this time of year is because of your son, Jesus. And we are so grateful that you sent him to us. And uh, Father, I just ask that as we uh, worship you today, um, here, and it goes across the, the internet uh, into the homes and different places of our people and hopefully others uh, that you will be honored and that you will be glorified. And, uh, Father, that your message will be received and heard. And, uh, Father, that it will give strength uh, to all those who hear it. God, we love you. We thank you. And we just give you all glory and honor and praise in the mighty and awesome name of your son, Jesus. Good morning. I uh, wish you all Merry Christmas. I want you to just look around in your living room and get your family all together. We're going to start by singing Joy to the World.
always one of my favorite hymns. I, I hope it's one of yours. Uh, just kind of reminds us of Christmas is just all about. Oh 
How about people there? Well, amen. That, that is wonderful. Merry Christmas to you and Merry Christmas to you that are here, the few that are here. And um, I'm so glad that you joined us. Listen, um, I am totally bombed. I don't know about you. I'm totally bombed about this situation. Uh, but uh, after a prayer and much consideration and uh, some wrangling with God as well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, I thought, uh, based upon the fact that we have approximately nine people who are suffering right now from some type of COVID um, um, symptom, and also have been uh, confirmed to have COVID. So um, I thought it was best to, uh, in, in your interest, that we go online for the next three weeks. And um, I, I thought it was amazing as I was thinking about this. When did it first happen? It happened, when did we first go online is what I'm talking about. It happened during Easter. Yep. And then, it happened again at Christmas. Uh, I, 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 I don't think it's any uh, coincidence that that happened. You know, Satan does have influence over this world. He does have influence over this world. But what he doesn't have influence over is Jesus. And what he doesn't have influence over is us being able to worship, even if it's worshiping remotely. And so that's what I want you to keep in mind uh, this Christmas is that uh, uh, Jesus is still on the throne. God is still ruling. And, but uh, uh, we live in a fallen world. What a great reminder that we live in a fallen world. Uh, just uh, being uh, separated the way we are um, right now. And uh, I want to let you know that I love you. And um, I am here to support you. If you need anything, please let me know. And we will uh, make sure that uh, we try our best uh, to serve you in any way that we can. I also want to remind you at uh, 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve, we'll be coming live to you from my living room. We'll have some singing. We'll have uh, the Christmas story at 5 o'clock live on Facebook. We'll be in my living room. And um, uh, just uh, tune in with your family. And... We'll have some opportunities there for you to sing along with us. Uh, my family will also be singing some songs. And uh, we just want you to, uh, to tune in and uh, enjoy what Christmas is all about. And uh, make sure you do that live on Facebook um, Christmas Eve. Well, two weeks ago, we started uh, this series of sermons uh, that, that I've entitled Regifting Christmas. Regifting Christmas. And uh, in the first sermon, Pastor Terry introduced three things that we as followers of Christ are called to do uh, this Christmas. And those things were, the three points of his sermon, were, uh, these things were, uh, we are called to worship more fully. Uh, we are called to re-gift God's love. And we are called to spend less and to give more. And so... The follow-up to that initial sermon is to take a look at each of these items uh, in reverse and discover more about how we can really experience the, the true meaning of Christmas by focusing on what we are called to do as Christ followers. And so, as I said, we're working backwards in these points, and uh, I don't want to miss, and I, don't, I know that you don't want to miss, the true meaning of this season and I, I, I want you to experience the joy of knowing that, that you and your family are focused on the meaning that God wants us to focus on. Last week we looked at that, uh, the first of these three sermons. Uh, we looked at uh, the fact that we're to spend less and to give more. This week we're going to be camping out on that, the second of these points. And that is that we are called to re-gift God's love. You know, sometimes, sometimes I think that we allow circumstances and consequences to convince us that God has somehow forgotten us, that God doesn't love us, that God has, has abandoned us, and this, these circumstances overwhelm us. And my plan was today, initially, was to have 
three people to give a testimony on how God has um, provided his love through his people to them. How God has re-gifted the love that, that he has felt. And so, um, because we're not able to meet together, what I did is I punted. <laughs> and I, what I did is I looked at scripture, and I'm going to allow the testimony of some people from scripture to remind you how God loved them and how they realized that they had a greater purpose and that how they re-gifted God's love that was given to them. And I, I think about the many circumstances that surrounded these men and women in Scripture, and yet they, they persevered knowing that the circumstance that they found themselves in was not a reflection of God's enduring love, but it was a result of living in a fallen world. We're going to look at some people that you wouldn't necessarily, um, uh, you wouldn't necessarily uh, think of during the Christmas season. But I really believe that it's the Christmas story is lived out through just plain, simple individuals. And so we're going to look at, uh, I believe, three or four people from Scripture and... Um, Look at how God has, uh, God's love was given to them and how they re-gifted that love. The first one we're going to look at is Deborah. Deborah. You know, difficulty comes in all shapes. Difficulty comes in all sizes. Sometimes difficulty isn't a, uh, isn't a tra drastic tragedy, but sometimes difficulty can be found in the, in the busy chaos of, of managing life. And so with what we want to accomplish on a, a weekly basis, we can end up worn out. We can end up disappointed. We can end up uh, never feeling like we're really accomplishing anything. As a pastor, I don't know about you, but as a pastor, it seems that my to-do list feels like it goes on forever. That I never finish my to-do list. It's always being added to. Deborah was one of those amazing, talented people who seemed to be able to kind of do it all. Deborah was a leader. She was a judge. She was a prophetess. She was a wife. She was a mother. And along with that, she courageously led her people, Israel, into battle. You know, every day we, we work demanding jobs, many of us, and and do what we can to help care for our families. Uh, we might not have the title Deborah, Deborah had, but life demands a lot from us each and every day. Uh, settling disputes within our family and outside of our family and helping people with issues and problems in their lives, finances, kids, our health, um, you, you can just think of all of the things that, that you deal with on a weekly basis. Deborah's family, the, the people of Israel, had its dysfunction just like many of ours do. Hers was just on a bigger scale. Uh, we can look, at, look to her as an example of, for, for how to handle the chaos of our daily lives. Turn with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter 4. And as we talk about these people, we're going to look at different sections of Scripture, so be ready to kind of flip through Scripture and, and look at some things. Judges chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, is where we're going to be. Judges chapter 4, verse 14. As you turn there, I just want to remind you that um, God loves you. God loves you. He has a greater purpose for you. And his desire is for you to give that love away. Judges chapter 4 verse 14. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and all of his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. 
And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. You see, Deborah believed and trusted God in a way that can be hard for us to do in conflict. God was real to her. God was present in her life. And she believed that victory was already hers because God was on her side. If I had this strong of a belief that God's hand was in every effort of my day, I think I would be a lot more content with my with each day's accomplishments. Uh, I, I wouldn't be so overwhelmed with, the, with a busy schedule in my life, but I would believe that I could handle it because God was on my side. Amen. Why did she do what she did? Turn in Judges chapter 5, the next chapter over. Verse 7 of Judges chapter 5, it says, Villagers in Israel would not fight. They head back, held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. You see, what was it that Deborah described herself as to Israel? She described herself as a mother to Israel. I think we can learn from this. Uh, we can learn that Deborah cared about the people she led like a mother cares for her children. She was motivated to serve no matter what the demands were because she cared about the people. She didn't care about the title. She didn't care about the accomplishments, but she cared for others. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and do what? And to love your neighbors as yourself. You see, Deborah did what she did for Israel because God, she knew that God was with her. God had given her love, and what she did is she took the love that God had for her and she transferred it over to mothering, if you will, the people. To, to loving others. Regifting God's love is not always the easy way out. And it may require much of you. But here's the thing. Regifting God's love always leads to blessing. We can take the example of another biblical testimony. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Turning your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We're going to get there eventually. Luke chapter 1 is where we find this testimony. Zechariah and Elizabeth. A longing unfulfilled can be disheartening, can't it? To have this longing with you and, it, and it's, it's, it's unfulfilled. Imagine having been married for a long time, unable to have children and and living in a culture that measures God's love for you by the number of children that you have. People would look at Zechariah and Elizabeth and say, well, they must be cursed because Elizabeth's womb is closed. God must not love them. God must have something against them. This is the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, a, a couple described as being very old and childless. They're an example of people who understood longing unfulfilled. The heartache of, of being denied something you long for and not knowing why you've been denied that thing. So have you ever been denied something that you've longed for? Over a long period of time. Maybe it's a lingering health situation that just won't go away. Maybe it's a, it's a child who rejects your influence, who disengages from the family and walks away. Maybe it's a character weakness that you just can't overcome. You desire, your desire is to overcome that, but it just seems to wield its ugly head and you give in. Maybe it's a sin that, that plagues you. 
Maybe it's a relationship that you long to have with somebody that just won't come into to fruition. Zechariah and Elizabeth understand. If they were to testify today, they would stand up here and say, I know what you're going through. But they also understood what it meant to be faithful while waiting on God. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now skip down to verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. And he will turn many from of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. You know what inspires me about Zechariah and Elizabeth is their ability to trust God in the midst of an unfulfilled longing. Uh, we, we know they trusted God because Scripture says that they continued to serve God. They continued to act righteously. That's how God describes them in His Word, that they were righteous. The angel showed up to Zechariah with good news while Zechariah was where? While he was serving as a priest. He could have given up on God altogether, but decided to keep serving despite his unfulfilled longing. So the question for us today is how do we handle adversity? If you're like many, when you endure adversity for any length of time, it can, it can be easy to lose faith and quickly turn to self-pity and, and unbelief, even bitterness toward God. And this leads us to quit praying. We expect God to move, and if God's not going to move in our life, then we're just not going to connect with Him in any way. The story of Zechariah and Elizabeth is about two things, the faithfulness of God and what it means to live by faith. First, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth is about the faithfulness of God. And, and when I get overwhelmed or when... When I, when I get worn out, what do I want to do? I want to quit. Uh, I want to quit thinking about others. I want to think about myself. I want to think about what I'm going through. Uh, I want to quit thinking about my friends or my family or my neighborhood. I want to focus on myself. But God showed his faithfulness with Zechariah and Elizabeth by working to bless their lives because they continued to work in the face of adversity. Secondly, Zechariah and Elizabeth lived by faith with the conviction that God loved them and wanted to bless them. They had a desire to stay righteous while they waited for, for their longings to be filled. Fulfilled, they never ceased to re-gift the love that they knew that God had for them. They didn't walk away from that love. They didn't put that love aside. They knew that God loved them and God had a greater purpose for them. So they continued to serve. 
Yeah, they had a longing in their heart. But they didn't walk away from God. They re-gifted the love that God had given to them despite living with unfulfilled longings. When we experience periods of waiting, we can have hope by remembering God's love and God's faithfulness and choosing to live by faith ourselves as we re-gift what has been given to us. The next person that I want to give you testimony of is Isaiah. You can turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 21. We'll find ourselves there in just a second. The book of Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 21. Isaiah was chosen by God to deliver an important message to the Israelites. God set his people up for an incredible future of redemption and hope. But before all that can happen, God gave Isaiah an intense vision that overwhelmed him. And this is a crucial moment for Isaiah to trust in the Lord's plan and faithfulness, even in the midst of adversity. Isaiah chapter 21, verse 3. These are the words of Isaiah. He says, Therefore my loins are filled with anguish. Pains have seized me. Like the pangs of a woman in labor. I am bowed down so that I cannot hear. I am dismayed so that I cannot see. My heart staggers. Horror has appalled me. The twilight I longed for has been turned for me into trembling. You know, one of the biggest fears, I think, in our lives is the fear of receiving bad news. The fear of receiving bad news. For most, bad news is usually followed by thoughts of the worst case scenario. Thinking, uh, 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 thinking that only, only, it can only get worse from here. And, and suddenly being overtaken by torrents of anxiety and feelings of helplessness in the midst of bad news. seems like during these times, prayer can be very difficult. Our flesh finds relief in making a plan to figure out a solution on our own. But something I've learned about going through difficulty is that it can become an opportunity to transform your prayer life. Sometimes... I harden to my pain by minimizing and, and hiding it. And in the midst of that, when I'm going through this, this deep pain and, and I've received this bad news, I can get annoyed and even offended when a friend tries to help me. You don't understand what I'm going through. What, what, what are you saying? My resistance to vulnerability makes me unsympathetic to others even. I think my pain must be greater than any pain that anybody is going through. And many times, as I'm going through this difficulty, as I have received this bad news, I'm smiling on the outside, but on the inside I'm dying. What that leads to is fakeness. I can, I can fake being concerned for others because my pain, in my mind, is bigger than theirs. But I can fake and I can smile and I can act like I'm concerned. And so, what happens is the great commandment becomes a sideline. Because I've received bad news, it's very difficult for me at that point to love God. And then in the midst of that bad news, I am not willing to love others either.
And so my resistance to vulnerability makes me unsympathetic and fake before God and before others. Isaiah is inspiring because he doesn't hold back with God. He expresses his deep pain and how hard it is to hear and, and see God in the, in, in the midst of all of this. He, he's honest before God. And yet his connection to God deepens in the midst of the difficulty. Isaiah chapter 49 Turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. It says, And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, this is Isaiah's words, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity, yet surely my right, my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. I think part of the reason Isaiah's faith stayed strong despite bad news was because he was honest about his doubt. He was honest about his frustration. He believed that God had a greater purpose even in the pain that he was in the midst of. Believing that God chose, chose me to, to help others know him both challenges me and inspires me in today's time. You see, God sometimes requires me and you to be the bearer of bad news. And yet, at the same time, we're supposed to remind the people we're bringing the bad news to of God's love. For them and for others. You see, regifting God's love is important. It, life and death can be in the is in the balance of how you portray God in the midst of bad news. There have been people who have completely walked away from God in the midst of bad news. God doesn't love me. God isn't all powerful. God isn't real. It would have been very easy, as Isaiah was a prophet, for him to, to bring this bad news and then turn the people of Israel against God. But that's not what he did. He, he reminded people that God loves them even in the midst of the bad news that he had to bring. How do you respond to adversity? Are you re-gifting God's love in the midst of bad news? Our vulnerable prayers unlock a deeper level of intimacy with God that we, uh, that we can gift others with. You see, other people need to see, if, if you are the receiver of the bad news, other need, people need to see, you can be, example, be an example of God's love by... Staying connected with God and being honest before God, yet trusting Him at the same time. It's really uh, a balance. There's nothing wrong with lamenting before God. We see it in Scripture all the time. We heard Isaiah there saying he couldn't breathe. He, he, was, he was stricken. He, he, was, he was breathless. He, the news was terrible. And yet he constantly remind, reminded the people who God was in the midst of the bad news. And that's what we are to do as we re-gift the love of God to others. Never doubt God's love. 
Never doubt that he cares for you. Even in a fallen world where you receive bad news. The fourth testimony that I'd like to give you is the testimony of David. Testimony of David. Has this ever come out of your mouth? This is not how I pictured it to happen. Has that ever been a thought of yours? This is not how I pictured it. Uh, I think we all have a picture of how we want our life to play out, how we think our life is going to play out. Everyone experiences periods in life that look nothing like they imagined it would look like. You see, David was anointed king of Israel. He was, he was held a hero, uh, a hero for conquering Goliath. He led numerous successful military campaigns. He became the head of military operations for Israel. He married the king's daughter. He had it all going for him. And then suddenly, because of a jealous king named Saul, David spent the next 10 or more years running from him. Held up in caves with a motley crew of misfits. It'd be safe to say that this is not how David pictured his journey toward the king of Israel. In difficult times, we may be tempted to believe that God has abandoned us and has lost a vision for us. This was not how we pictured this going, God. The, the temptation is to believe that because our, our dreams are shattered and because our hopes are destroyed, that God no longer has a plan for our lives. But with the encouragement of friends and with prayer, and with others re-gifting the, the love God has given them, we really have to decide whether our faith is going to be in our circumstances, or is our faith going to be in God? Putting our faith in God means we are not going to quit. We're going to persevere. But rather, we're going to continue to learn. We're going to continue to grow. We're going to change what we need to change. As the story of David, God's destiny for our lives does not change because our circumstances do. You need to hear that today. Your destiny before God does not change because your circumstances change here on earth. David's destiny was fulfilled and he became king of Israel. In fact, his difficult circumstances made him more compassionate, more humble, made him to be what God described him to be, a man after God's own heart. There's no greater joy than seeing God's destiny rise above our circumstances. He loves us. You don't believe that he loves you? Turn to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are cold or are in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels can't. The demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. 
Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I read that from the New Living Testament. New Living Translation. Excuse me. But I read it from that because it really spoke to me as I read it from that translation. Not that any other translation doesn't speak to me, but this really spoke to me. It, so how do we experience God's love? One of the many benefits of receiving Christ as your personal Savior is that you become part of the body of Christ. The Bible describes the body of Christ as those who have genuinely trusted Him. And as followers of Him, you have been Adopted into a new family, a, a forever family. And one of the best ways that we experience God's love is through the family that surrounds us. Through the family of God. We have been loved, and it's our responsibility then to take that love and to share that love with others. To re-gift that love that has been given to us. We need to give that love to those who need it the most. We need to make sure that the Deborahs of the world know that God loves them and has a greater purpose for them. We need to, know, we need to make sure that the Elizabeth and Zacharias of this world know that God loves them and has a great purpose and a plan for them. We need to let the the Isaiah's of this world who have received bad news know that God loves them and that God has a greater purpose for them. We need to let the Davids in this world whose life is not going as they pictured it, we need to let them know that God loves them and has a great purpose for them. And so one of the best ways that we experience God's love is through those who are in his family. We've been loved, and it's our responsibility to share that love. And sharing God's love does two things. The first one is this. Sharing His love within this family gives assurance and comfort. Sharing His love within the family of God gives assurance and comfort. Have you ever been comforted by the family of God? Have you been given that love and all of a sudden your assurance of God loving you is multiplied? And that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God does indeed love you. That you're seeing God in the flesh through people's hands and in the midst of people's lives. In the midst of your own life because you're seeing God in action. I heard a story one time of a little boy. You, you may have heard this. This is a common pastor story, I think. But there was a little boy that was deathly afraid of thunderstorms. And he was in his room and, and the thunder started rolling and the lightning started flashing and he... He got scared, and he, 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 he was trembling, and he was crying. And so he, the next clap of thunder, he ran out of his room, ran into his parents' room, and said, uh, I'm afraid. And his mom woke up and said, Son, I, I told you there's no need to be afraid that Jesus is with you. And the little boy said, I, I know Jesus is with me, but I just need Jesus with skin on. That's the way it is with regifting God's love. Sometimes we just need Jesus with skin on. We need Jesus with skin on. And sharing his love with, within the family of God gives assurance and gives comfort. The second thing that sharing God's love does is 
sharing his love outside of the family of God, outside of this family, draws people to the source of this love. Sharing God's love outside of this family draws people to the source of this love. When people outside of God's family are loved, they become curious as to why somebody would love them, why somebody would reach out to them. And that's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to point them to the source of the love that has been given to us. I heard a pastor say one time, more people are loved to Christ than are one to Christ. And one thing that I found is our church is pretty good at this. We're a loving church. You have done a great job of re-gifting the love that's been given to us, but I'm under the conviction that we can do better in the coming year. We can do better in the coming year. In week one of this series, Pastor Terry mentioned that as Christians, we should be professional re-gifters, and that is so true of this church as we give away the love that's been given to us. We need to become professional re-gifters. And so there you have it. There are four testimonies of how people within Scripture have experienced God's love. And we're called to be echoes of those who have lived like this in the past. We're called to re-gift God's love. You say, well, Pastor Mike, this, this is right before Christmas, and you didn't preach about the manger, and you didn't preach about the shepherds, and you didn't preach about the angels, you didn't preach about being taxed and going to Bethlehem. You didn't preach about all of those things. Well, I did. And if you didn't hear it, let me sum it up in a couple of verses. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And in 1 John chapter 3, by this we know love, because he's, he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay, our, lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. You see, the cause of Christmas because of the manger. Because God first loved us. We should be re-gifting God's love. And that's what we're here to do at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. We're here to love God. And to love people. Let me lead you in a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for loving us. And Lord, this Christmas is just a little different. But it's also the same. I pray that we do not doubt the fact that God loves us. And God, I pray that you would allow us your church, your people, you'd allow us to 
take the love that you've given to us and to re-gift it, to give it away. God, today we looked at the testimony of some people in Scripture who were going through some very difficult times. Needless to say, our many of our lives are very difficult right now. So God, I pray that we would take the example of these that we've heard from and that you would allow us to continue to love you and love others even in the midst of circumstances. And we know that Scripture tells us that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay his life down for his friends. We also know that Jesus himself said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. God, I pray that as we think of our community and think of the things that are going on around us, God, I pray that you would allow us to convey your love, to be loved, to be Jesus with skin on, to those who are around us. Maybe you're watching today and you don't have a personal relationship with Christ. We want to make sure that we share God's love with you today. Because Jesus said of himself, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came, yeah, he came in a manger, but he grew up to be a man. And what he did is he took the, he, he lived a sinless life. He took your sin and my sin with him on the cross and died for you and for me. The Bible says that he was beaten for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement our chastisement that we deserve was upon him. He bore our load. He carried the cross and he died for you and me. And so this Christmas, I want to invite you to accept the gift that God has given to you in his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a gift for you this Christmas. Let me lead you in a prayer right where you are. Pray something like this right there where you are. God, I realize that I'm a sinner, and I have failed you in many ways. And God, my life... Many times it's been difficult. And I may have even questioned your love for me. But God, right now, I want to put my trust in you. I want to accept your free gift of love. Allow, I want to allow Jesus to cleanse me and make me whole. And I will follow him for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you again to God's family. You're part of this greater family that I talked about in the sermon. You're part of the love of God. We're going to end this, I think, by singing Silent Night. Is that right? If you would take just a few minutes right there where you are and send us a message here at the church. 
That's all you would need to do. Send us a message at the church saying, I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. What do I do now? You can send it in a message. You can type it into the, the stream there. And we'll contact you and give you the next steps. We love you. Thank you for being here. Tim.